Welcome on the talk uh, about using the real built-in security technologies on a daily basis. I'm uh, Dalibor Pospisil. I work as QE uh, at Red Hat for about 10 years almost. And my co-presenter is Sergio Correa, who's a software engineer and uh, he's with Red Hat uh, for like two years almost. And uh, I will be uh, giving him uh, a word uh, for the second half, roughly. So let's start. Uh, what's our um, today uh, presentation about? I will uh, briefly uh, talk about our team, and then uh, I will switch over to technologies we cover. Uh, so let's start with, with our team. Um, uh, we cover quite a lot of uh, components, uh, uh, which are not all of them uh, focused on this uh, specific uh, topic I'm going to talk about. But our main uh, focus is on authorization of various forms. Uh, these forms uh, are uh, mainly about user authorization, USB device authorization, application authorization, and uh, automated unlocking of uh, encrypted volumes, which is also kind of authorization of this of this uh, procedure. <clears throat> so what are the technologies I'm going to talk about uh, today? These are sudo, USB guard, FA policy D, and PBD and BDE. Um, these are those categories I mentioned before and uh, uh, the technologies we, uh, which are covering those specific areas. So let's jump directly to sudo. Uh, it's a, a user authorization tool. Uh, there are links uh, to upstream and also uh, the customer portal. So you can go there and click it, click on it if you want to. Uh, so what, what sudo is about, uh, this is like the most one of the most important uh, tools uh, of uh, sysadmins. It uh, gives uh, gr great granularity of uh, permission granting to users, and also it's able to uh, use different sources for the configuration and, and the rules. Um, what's important uh, to say is that this is not only uh, a prefix, uh, which might be seen uh, in a various uh, tutorials uh, in in the internet. Uh, it does a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, for example, it uh, it uses the the rule sources from various places. It's uh, able to use, of course, local files. Uh, it's able to use uh, LDAP uh, as a backend, or through uh, triple SD uh, component. It's able to use uh, various other uh, backends uh, such as IPA. Uh, it's able to uh, set uh, to, to to control access for uh, various persons. So it's it's able to control who, where, uh, when, and what uh, is a user able to do the certain actions. And also, it can generate and it generates actually logs of various types. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's jump uh, to some uh, examples. Uh, let's uh, uh, let's say that uh, we have user test, and uh, uh, the user test has this uh, uh, pseudo rule. Uh, the pseudo rule says that user test is able to run on all systems as any user there uh, uh, command uh, ID. Uh, without giving a password, and uh, it's able to run it be, uh, between the time, uh, like this not before and not after defines the time window. The, if you take a look at the numbers, it gives the user exactly one minute to do, uh, like to execute ID command without typing a password. So uh, in real, it looks like this. Uh, I run uh, date, and sudo id command at, at the same time. So we, we are quite sure that uh, this is running uh, in that specific time. And um, 
you can see that uh, this time 10 uh, 50, uh, 49 is before 1050 which is defined uh, here in the in the rule so the user is asked for the password uh, later uh, when uh, times go uh, and uh, the time is now uh, 10 uh, 50 and something uh, user is suddenly uh, able to execute uh, the id command using sudo and you can see that the output of ID command here. And uh, again, uh, when times go, uh, when time goes, uh, uh, after 10, uh, 51, uh, the user should not be able to, to do that action anymore. So again, it asks for password and because, uh, uh, yeah, because the rule says that, um, uh, usage of ID without password would be just limited without, uh, within this time frame. So this is just a simple example how to limit the user for, for using a command within the specific time frame. Let's uh, use a, a slightly more uh, complicated um, output which also shows the abilities to log uh, the session. So uh, the first example was basically you have user but uh, you want uh, to let him do certain actions just within the specific time frame and this action is specifically limited to just one command now we have different uh, situation where we have uh, some kind of admin user and uh, we want to give him uh, greater opportunities so we can uh, specify for example this rule uh, that uh, admin user is able to run uh, anything, virtually anything, on any system uh, as user test, and uh, it will do input logging, output logging, and again, it won't uh, ask for passwords. So it's uh, for for this purpose, it's simpler to to show it. So, uh, what happened? If the admin user uses sudo minus i minus u test, which means I want to uh, run interactive session as a user test. So um, normally uh, the command line for the test user will pop up and, um, uh, and uh, the, I can, the, the admin can uh, can type some commands so i jump to tmp for example i do ls minus one which lists the content of the of the directory now uh, i uh, as a administrator of the system i trust the admin user uh, a lot because i gave him a right to execute anything but i am i want to be sure what's he doing so i enabled this input and output logging so i can see if i use sudo replay uh, tool minus l uh, to see uh, what are the recorded recorded sessions and uh, i can also replay that session so uh, if you search uh, for uh, the id of that session uh, here it's uh, ID uh, 00001. Um, I can use this uh, this ID to replay actually what the user did. Uh, so I can use the sudo replay again uh, just with the with the ID, and it will replay the session for me, uh, in, including the the output and and the, uh, the the input and output. So I can see in real time that uh, the user typed these commands and uh, that there was this uh, output and the, the user then exited the, the session so this is like the uh, ability to track what the user is actually doing um, so what are the threat preventions uh, here for sudo uh, like abilities uh, of sudo for threat prevention so this is basically uh, what i already said that users are limited just to certain actions and the other one uh, like these are the, the most important of course there are many more um, the other one is the logging activities uh, so you can you can even log uh, passwords if you want, but these are like disabled for uh, by default. Okay, uh, let's jump to to another. Uh, 
uh, USB guard, which is a tool for USB device authorization. Again, there are some links to upstream Red Hat portal and also uh, this year's talk, uh, which happened yesterday. Uh, so you can uh, go there and see uh, like the news of in, in the USB guard. Uh, and of course, you can you can uh, read through the documentation as well. So again, what's the what's the USB guard in general? This is the, the software framework uh, which implements authorization uh, policies for USB devices. Uh, it helps uh, to protect a system uh, against uh, intrusive or unwanted uh, devices. Uh, there are uh, it's. There are three main parts. Uh, the first is uh, system service, which enforces uh, the, the policy. Uh, then there are the policy rules. And there is also the, the uh, command line interface uh, for uh, managing the, the, the rules. Uh, again, some simple uh, examples. So first off, I need to start the service. System CTL start uh, USB guard. Then I can use this USB guard uh, command line interface to list the devices. These are the devices already registered by the service, by the running service. So I can see, uh, among others, that there is some uh, some uh, device, uh, QMU uh, USB tablet, uh, because I'm using a virtual machine for this purpose. So I can see this uh, this device, and I can see that the device is uh, currently blocked. So what I can do about it uh, to make it work? I can use this CLI command, uh, USB guard allow dash device. And I just use this uh, number five, which is just the ID, uh, which was provided by the list command. And uh, suddenly the, the device is enabled. If I list the devices again, I can see that the device is now allowed. Okay, uh, this is pretty simple, uh, but this is like just one time shot. Uh, if I want to um, create the, the rules, I need to uh, first generate the, the policy. Uh, for that uh, purpose, there is a command USB guard generate uh, slash policy, which uh, basically uh, grabs the currently uh, attached devices and uh, I can put it to the file and to install the file to the uh, final uh, destination, which is the etc USB guard rules conf. There is also another possibility to use rules D uh, directory, but uh, this is out of scope of, of this talk. And then I can restart the service, and the service is uh, able now to apply all the rules for all the devices which were generated for the policy. Then I can, of course, tweak it uh, using the CLI or directly, directly editing the rules conf, which is not uh, uh, recommended. The, the, the CLI is recommended here. Um, okay, again, uh, what are the threat preventions here? Uh, for example, in the servers, uh, in, in the server room, uh, which is normally secured, but uh, there are some people who has access and uh, someone may want to uh, persuade the, the administrator of that lab that uh, he, he, you want to, well, you want him to, uh, to put there some uh, USB stick, which is able to do certain actions uh, like install something to the system and so on. So you can basically lock all the USBs uh, in the server and enable only those you trust to. For example, you can enable devices just by the serial number. Uh, the other possibility, uh, which is more like uh, possible, is uh, imagine the situation you have a laptop in the cafe and uh, uh, you are talking to somebody else and you turn around and somebody just plugs uh, a, a little uh, stick in, in the USB guard, which is almost uh, not noticeable. So uh, it again can, for example, uh, log your keystrokes. Uh, so he, that the potential uh, attacker can, uh, can read uh, all your passwords, for example. So this is a, another case where, where this can help. 
Uh, the next technology I want to present here is uh, FA Policy D. This is application authorization tool. Again, you have uh, links here. There was talk uh, at the last year's uh, DEFCONF uh, with more details. Uh, so again, you can uh, you can watch it. And uh, in in a nutshell, uh, what is uh, FA Policy D? This is the software framework uh, which uh, allows you to control applications based on the policy. Um, this is like the most efficient ways way of, uh, how to prevent running untrusted and possibly malicious uh, applications on the system. Again, it's compound uh, used by various uh, components. There is again a system service running. There is again uh, the policy, the rules. Uh, there is also a, a database of trust, which is important. And uh, nowadays it's uh, like prefer preferred way to, to use uh, for, for tweaking the policy. Uh, and there is a uh, command line interface to, to control it. Uh, the rules uh, define uh, the target. Uh, it may be allow, deny, allow audit, deny audit. And it says the, these um, targets for a specific subject and object. And uh, uh, so you can specify which subject, meaning which running binary, can do certain actions with the, with the object, meaning file on the disk. It may be open or execute um, uh, action. And FA policy D can decide based on the rules what to do, what, what to uh, allow, what to deny, and whether it, we want to also audit uh, the action. Um, yeah, so the message is issued to audit log or syslog uh, based on the configuration. Again, uh, some examples. This is uh, a part of, of the default uh, rules. Uh, the, the rules are processed one by one. The first match wins. So if uh, nothing matches, the, it goes uh, at the end and, and there is a like final set of rules which match. Uh, and um, yeah, like this uh, yellow one is uh, kind of uh, important for us because it tells us that uh, any application can execute trusted objects. Just this simple information, just trusted objects. And that's something I will explain in the, in the trust database uh, slides later. Um, <clears throat> so what's actually the trust uh, database? Uh, this is a, a database of files uh, which are normally gathered from uh, RPMDB and uh, local customization list. Um, and um, this is, as I said already, this is the preferred way how to tweak the policy, like in general. Um, so uh, all the RPM files which are deployed on the system are automatically uh, put to the trust DB, so you don't need to other with uh, with those files just uh, provide the rpm and if administrator uh, installs the rpm all the files are automatically uh, trusted uh, for the fa policy d and there is a, a command line interface uh, which provides a easy way to manage it so uh, let's see how to do that um, again the fa policy d is a system service so we need to start it and uh, now we have uh, a test user, for example, uh, who is trying to uh, to to exec, uh, in this case, id command, user bin id. Uh, you can see that the command uh, executed normally, but if the user copies the binary uh, to its uh, home uh, directory, uh, then uh, he's not able to uh, execute it from that home directory because uh, uh, FA policy D uh, uh, no that does not uh, trust this uh, binary anymore so what we can do about that the user may go to the admin and say hey admin I have this uh, super cool binary I want to be able to run it and what should uh, the administrator do is to inspect the binary, see uh, whether it's uh, like official version, not not no malware is there, 
uh, and uh, the admin can add the file to to the trusted uh, database using the CLI uh, command uh, dash dash file add meaning add the file to to the uh, trustdb uh, trust database and uh, to upload the the new database to to the memory for the uh, for the daemon for the service uh, so suddenly a user is able to run uh, the binary from its uh, home directory so this is like in, in a nutshell how it works uh, the database may be uh, managed by uh, following commands uh, so I can add file I can update the file if if I need some new version uh, and I replace the, the the binary it won't be trusted anymore because it has changed so I need to update it uh, update it's um, like um, attributes in, in the database I can also remove the file from the database and uh, uh, and I can or I sh when I do some uh, updates to the database, I need to update uh, uh, or tell the, the service to, to reload this database. Uh, now, uh, a very uh, new feature here is integrity checking, which uh, shifts the, the trust database to a little uh, higher like level. Uh, and it's able to uh, check the integrity of that specific uh, trusted files using uh, either size, file size, or uh, hash uh, com computed uh, directly using the, the service, or the hash uh, uh, provided by IMA feature. So if, if you happen to have uh, IMA feature enabled uh, on your system, you can use this um, IMA uh, integration for, for the integrity, so you save some time for the uh, uh, hash computing uh this is basically uh like this is a bit uh, uh view to the inside uh you can uh you can dump the the trust db and if i search uh, the trust db for that specific file I, I was talking about i can see that it was like local uh, custom modification it's uh, from file it's not from rpm uh, this is the path to the file this is the size of that file and this is the hash of the file uh, if I issue the ls command, I can see that size match. And also, if I uh, count the sum, uh, the, the, the hash, uh, I can see that the hash also matches. So this is the way how to uh, like improve the security. Uh, because if, if you replace, just replace the, the, the binary and you don't use this integrity checking, it, it's uh, basically considered just by a path. So it, it might not be sufficient. Okay, uh, what are the threat preventions here? Uh, this is uh, uh, th this can be used, for example, um, using some uh, malware uh, sent by by the email, and. Uh, uh, imagine the situation you, you receive an email and you are not careful enough and click on some link. There might be some uh, some JavaScript uh, which downloads uh, some binary from, from the internet and tries to execute it. So this is exactly the, the way uh, how to prevent uh, the execution because otherwise normally uh, the user won't, uh, would be able to execute such binary. So this is nice way how to prevent uh, executing of uh, unwanted, unknown, potentially malicious uh, binaries. OK, and now I will hand over uh, to Sergio, who will continue with PBD and BDE part. Uh, so uh, as the liver mentioned, uh, I'm Sergio. I'm a software engineer with the Special Projects team. And I work mainly with what we call PBD NVD, which is a technology that allows for the automated unlocking of encrypted volumes. To complement this presentation on some of the technologies that we cover in our team, uh, let me talk a bit about NVD and what's new with it. So let's start by taking a look at these acronyms. So what's PBD and what's NVD? So PBD stands for 
policy-based decryption, and it basically enables the unlocking of encrypted volumes with the help of a software called Clevis. This Clevis software runs in the machine with the encrypted volumes, so basically on the client side. And then we have NBD, which stands for Network Bound Disk Encryption. And this is a subcategory of PBD. It, uh, uh, looking at uh, in a simple way, this is basically PBD, policy-based decryption, but when we use a special network server called Tank. So if you do PBD with Tank, this we call NBD, network bound this encryption. So from here we see that we have on the client side a software called Clevis, and on the server side a software called Tank. Uh, I listed in here some places where you can find additional info on PBD and BD. So I have listed three previous talks that basically introduce the concept uh, why the need for a solution like this, and then other talks that uh, explore it further, further. So please, I invite you to check them out. We all, I also listed the source code that we have available on GitHub. So please feel free to contribute by either reporting issues or even submitting pull requests for fixes. So what's new with NBD? Uh, basically, uh, what I'd like to highlight in this talk is that now we have the ability to set up NBD at scale with the help of Ansible. So Ansible is an automation platform that helps system admins with system deployment and maintenance. So we are able to perform maintenance and deploying of several systems at once. And in Ansible, we have the concept of playbooks and roles. So to see it in a simplified way, we can see playbooks as a collection of shell scripts. I mean, this is not a very true analogy, but just help us to see. So playbooks are a way to organize a series of tasks that will be run sequentially. And then we have roles, which are themselves self-contained automation units. So we will have like a set of specific tasks grouped together in a way that makes it simple to reuse it. So we can use roles to basically set up a series of services related service, uh, do some deployment of specific files, some configuration and all that. For NBD, uh, we recently made available a couple of Ansible roles, which are NBD server and NBD client. These roles are available as part of the Linux system roles product. So we have, a, I have a link in the slides. So you can go there and see a lot of roles for doing different stuff. Among them, NBD server and NBD client. So let's see how could we use the NBD roles. So at the NBD server role, uh, it allows us for configuring tank servers. It has the ability to rotate, fetch, and deploy tank keys. And if you see uh, in the gray box, this is the anatomy of an Ansible playbook. We basically have the ability to specify a set of hosts in which uh, the actions will be performed. So in my particular case, I have a, a, a group called NVD servers, and then, I specify some variables that are uh, variables from the host, from the, the role, like configuration settings for the role. I have also listed in these slides the full documentation of the role, so you can see every possible setting. In this example, uh, I have one configuration variable called NVD server rotate keys. I'm setting it to no, which basically will mean that no, I do not want to rotate keys. What is rotating keys in this context? Uh, it's basically uh, the act of creating a new set of keys. Like we have keys that are currently being used by Tank, and we, uh, periodically it's recommended that we rotate them, we change them. So this Ansible role can do that for us as well. And finally, I actually use the role itself. So it's not really complicated. Let's also see how could we do that uh, with the NVD client. So for configuring the client, it's a little bit more complicated because it has a little more settings. Again, I have listed the options 
from the documentation, maybe you can check it out later. But basically this NBD client role will make it simpler for us to deploy Clevis. So uh, if I want to use Clevis with, for instance, a couple of tank servers for high availability, I can do like in this example on the right. So similar to the previous playbook, I also specify my hosts, which in this case is NBD clients. And then I specify my variables. You see now I have an NBD client bindings variable. And inside that, I define some of the settings. For instance, I specify an encrypted device called, in this particular case, dev sda1. And then I specify where I can find the unencryption key, key file for, for that volume. And finally, I specify the 10 servers. So server one and server two in this example. And again, I call the, the role itself. So let me now show a pre-recorded demo showing how to use it. Uh, basically, I will have three machines. One that we are, I will call the Ansible controller. That will be the machine where Ansible will be actually running. And then I will have a couple of machines. One that will be running a VM with encrypted volumes. So I will have Clevis in there. I will install Clevis in there with the NVD client role. And in the other one, I will use to deploy Tang. So my Clevis VM you will be able to use the Tang server that I just deployed. So as you see in the right, I have my Clevis VM. Uh, since it's uh, a VM with an encrypted volume, on boot, it's asking me for the passphrase. So I'm going to provide it initially so that uh, the boot process continues. And then I move out to this machine that I call the Ansible controller. You see here well, a file that I call the inventory. So uh, in the inventory, I will be listing all the hosts involved in my setup. So I have three groups in there, one called all, one called NVD servers, and another one called NVD clients. You see that in all, I specify basically every host that I have. In this case, I have two. And then my NVD servers group, I specify the servers that I will be deploying thank to. And then in NVD clients, I specify the VMs or the machines that where I have the encrypted volumes that I'm going to set up clubs. To actually run a playbook, uh, we use a command called Ansible playbook. So but before that, let me go to the Tang machine. So in the Tang machine, I'm, I'm just making sure that uh, Tang is not really installed yet. So it's basically a server without Tang. And now I will run the playbook. I, uh, the command to use it is Ansible playbook. And then I'm able to specify the inventory. And then finally, the playbook itself. In this, in this case, servers YAML. So once Bo is doing its thing, it will take a little while, so I'm going to skip it slightly. So uh, while it's running, it's basically running a set of tasks that's pre-configuring the role, like it should be able to actually deploy and do all that's required. The role encapsulates all of that logic. So when I run this, after it completes, I will, I will have Tank deployed to all my servers listed in the inventory and in the playbook. And I can and I can check. For instance, now it's just completed. So uh, it shows also a recap at the end, showing the number of tasks that were okay, the number of tasks that caused the host to be changed. So uh, I will now move to the Tank server again and make sure. Check if the thing package is now installed. And as you can see, it is installed. So after we run the playbook, it was installed as expected. The service is also running right now. I'm now going to run the second playbook, which will deploy Clevis to the Clevis VM, which is showing on the left side. Let me again skip it a little bit. And while it's running, I will also move to the Clevis VM and log in there so that I can later reboot it when it's done. So the Ansible role is still running. 
it's now in one of the last steps, which is updating the init realm FS that I step required for Clevis. In this step, it basically includes some automation machinery in the init realm FS so that this part will be able to do the boot unlocking. And now it completed also successfully. So I went to the Clevis VM and issued a reboot command. So now let's hit reboot. Again, it will ask for the passphrase because it's an encrypted volume. But this time I will not provide it myself. I mean, I will not type the password myself. Since I deployed Clevis, Clevis is bound to that tank server and that will be able to do the automated unlocking on boot. And basically, now the boot completed as expected. So we were able to deploy both Tang and Clevis, and we tested it, and it works as expected. I have also listed in the presentation a source for the playbooks and the inventory that I used in this demo, and also the video itself, since I believe this uh, slides we could share as a PDF. I link the video as well if you want to watch it later. And that concludes this presentation. So thank you for attending. And if you have any questions, please, you have some time for it. Thank you.